Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who have seen me talk before, I'm sorry. For those of you who are new, uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, and we'll get directly into the program. And away we go. So first off, I'm going to apologize. We just found out a few minutes ago that the bottom line on my slides is cut in half. And it says Iris and Sada, the Japanese Iris. And it's going to say that on every slide. So you're not going to miss anything. But uh, I apologize for that. So um, before we get too far into this, I want to discuss a little um, iris anatomy just for um, the odd chance that somebody out there um, doesn't know the important parts of an iris. I'm going to use some terms today and I just want to make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about. Um, this, is, this is a Japanese iris called Chiyo no Haru. It's a um, iris that was imported from Japan, registered here in the States, I believe sometimes in the 80s, but um, we're not really sure how old it is. It could be 100 or 200 years old in Japan, but um, Chiyonoharu. Um, and so the three petals that you see um, arrowed to are what we call standards, petals that point upwards. And three petals that go downward we call falls. And on beardless iris, um, we have what is typically on Japanese iris, it's a gold um, triangular figure. We call that a signal. And um, the, beginning, the beginnings of the female reproductive part of the iris is called the style arm. And particularly in Japanese iris, the attractiveness of a style arm is all important because they're always right out there for God and everyone to see. So um, it's very important that they are um, attractively colored and attractively shaped. And we'll show you some great examples of that as we move along. So I want to start with a brief history of, of Iris and Sada. Um, they're, of course, native to Japan and Northeast Asia. Um, in Japan, they're known as Hanashobu. That's their term for the Japanese Iris. Um, they've been hybridized since uh, the early 1400s, where um, the regional warlords um, would have um, their own hybridizers. And um, each individual hybridizer, of course, worked in his own direction, um, specifically for the, um, for the families of the warlords to view. Um, the peasants were not allowed to grow them, um, not ever. And um, each different region had their own preferred way of viewing them. And of those ways, there are three main styles. And um, Chad will be very quick to point out that there are more than three styles, but, but there are three main styles. Um, the first is um, what is called a Edo style. And um, Edo uh, was a city in Japan that um, is now known as Tokyo. Um, and in the Edo style, they were grown outdoors in fields that either flooded during the rainy season or could be flooded. And, um, in a lot, um, and they were viewed from um, pavilions that were up on the hill, a hill beside or a berm beside the field, or perhaps they were viewed um, on wooden bridges that would wind their way through the fields. The Edo type iris is generally flat in form um, so that you could see them better from above them. And um, I don't have a good picture of uh, a pavilion overlooking um, an iris field. So I stole this woodblock print, uh, this picture of a woodblock print. And, um, but it, it's a great depiction of what I'm talking about. People would sit up in the, uh, up in the pavilion and, and uh, look over the, iris fields below. And, and if you look closely, you can kind of see a winding bridge through the field as well. And, and so these irises were meant to be looked at from, from the top down. And this is a great example. This is Haro no Umi. 
Then we have the Higo style, which is, is an offshoot from the Edo line, and, but they have a gently arching form. Instead of flat, the, the falls will tend to bend downwards. Um, now these were hybridized to have one perfect blossom per stalk. Um, in, in ancient Japan, they did not want what the American Iris Society likes, which is more buds for a longer bloom season. They wanted one stalk with one per perfect blossom. And the reason they did that is because um, they were grown in pots and brought indoors during, um, on the day the flower was about, the day the flower was opening. And, and so it was a, a day long event, um, kneeling in front of the pot of iris watching the flower open um, because it takes a full 24 hours for a Japanese iris to open all the way. Um, now, I don't know about you, but personally, I don't have a full day to sit and watch a flower open, um, but I can dream about it. And this is an example, uh, this is a picture of, of how they were viewed and, and uh, likely still are in Japan. Um, single blossom per pot, and then um, again, takes 24 hours for the flower to open. Oops, too fast. Um, and here's a great example of, a, of an, uh, an old um, iris from Japan um, of the Higo style with the uh, gently um, drooping falls. So Yamagurasu. And then the third style I want to talk about is the Issei style. And this one's very different from the other two in that, in that um, not only are they from the, around the Kyoto area, but um, they're very pendant in form. And um, they're primarily pastel in color. Um, Chad has shown me some that are, are darker, but pr primarily they're pastel in color. And in particular, they, they uh, like the color pink. Um, they're very light in substance, which is another um, thing that we at the American Iris Society consider a fault. Um, but th that was what they were hybridizing for back in the day. Um, and, and frequently with a crepe paper texture. And, and they were bred so that the foliage was taller than the flower for artistic reasons, because uh, um, that was the way they liked to, to view it. Um, and again, that light and substance and um, the foliage taller than the flower are two traits, um, if you're hybridizing for pink Japanese iris, that we're still fighting today, hundreds of years later. They spent hundreds of years breeding them down, and now we're trying to breed them back up, and, and, and it's, it's a struggle still. Um, to view them, they would arrange them on shelves. Um, to view many at one time, sort of like we might consider it um, an iris show, and it would look something like this. Um, but the, the, the Japanese people would never, never dream of judging the irises because um, they wouldn't want to offend the flowers that, were, that would not be judged worthy of, a, of, a, of a, an award. So they were just viewed for pleasure and, and certainly not for judging. Patrick, and, I, yes. I have a question, question for you. Um, you mentioned that it takes a, a day for the flower to open. Someone asked, uh, uh, Bonnie asked, how long does the blossom tend to last once it is fully open? Uh, up to three days. Okay. Um, I will tell you that um, for the first time probably in my life, we hit 112 degrees in our garden during Japanese iris bloom season last year, and they did not last three days. Um, they did not last one day um, in 112 degree heat. Um, but in typical um, weather where we are in our 70s or 80s, we get three days um, off of each blossom. Okay, so this is Hatsu Kagami, which is a, uh, an excellent example of an Issei iris. And you can start to see um, the crepe paper texture that I'm talking about. I do have another picture a little later on that really shows that crepe paper texture. Um, some people don't like it, I really do. I think it, it lends a lot to the flower itself. And I would be remiss um, if I was talking about Japanese iris and did not discuss Kemo Nursery in Japan. This is uh, Japan's largest um, Japanese iris nursery. 
Um, and um, um, it's certainly on my bucket list of places to go. A couple things to note about them. Um, um, I read that several years ago, pre-pandemic, um, they were making upwards of $13 million a year just on the tourist trade coming through. They're not even selling irises. Um, and uh, um, I need to figure that one out for my garden. Um, the other thing to note is in this picture, you're going to see some yellow irises. Um, those are not Japanese iris. Um, there is no true yellow Japanese iris um, in the world at this time. Um, the yellow you're seeing there are um, a species cross iris, where Japanese iris were crossed with um, some version of iris pseudocorus, and um, these are the resulting cross. So. Um, not true Japanese iris, but species cross. We will discuss um, the hybridizers um, work towards yellow um, a little later on in the program though. Uh, okay, so uh, um, the Japanese iris comes to America. Um, formerly, uh, the Japanese iris and sada was known as iris camphiri. And I bring that up because there are still people today that use that term. Um, it was reclassified sometimes in, sometime in the 1950s to Iris and Sada, um, but they're synonymous with each other now. Okay. And, and the first um, Japanese Iris that I'm aware of showed up in the United States in the late 1800s. And um, the oldest one that I grow is mahogany, um, which was registered, which was introduced to the public in 1893. Um, and the next one on in my garden is an iris called fascination, um, which was registered in 1926. Um, and some of the growers um, call it fascination child. Um, because there's three different iris fascination that were registered. And so some people call it fascination childs, but it's registered name is fascination. Okay. Um, w. Arley Payne um, is who we consider the founder of the Japanese iris movement in the US. Um, and in the 1930s, he imported six varieties of Japanese iris um, from Japan and brought them, grew them and made his first crosses. And during his time as a hybridizer, he raised over 100,000 seedlings. He numbered uh, 1,349 of them and registered 170. And, and many of those are still available today. And um, as a few examples, um, we have uh, um, Confetti Shower and Dappled Dragon and Glitter and Gaiety. Um, and this is uh, Mr. Payne at Camo Nursery. Um, and if you notice that large flowered purple iris in front of him, that is called the Great Mogul and uh, is semi-famous in the Japanese iris world, um, but thought to be extinct here in the United States though we know it's still alive at Camo Nursery. And I believe Chad Harris is still working on getting, um, getting that from Camo back to the state so we can um, reintroduce it to our society. And more of his hybrids. We have um, Fairy Carillon, um, which is one of my particular favorites. Um, Premier Dansur, which is a huge three-flowered um, Japanese iris, Strut and Flourish, and Wings of Flutter. Um, again, he had 170 that he introduced. I probably grow 20 of his, and I know that Chad and Carol still, uh, Car Chad Harris and Carol Warner have some that I don't have yet, um, but someday I'll get them from you. And this is what uh, Iris and Sada looks like in the wild. Um, this is a pure species form, unhybridized. And um, so imagine um, that over the 600 years that they have been hybridized, um, that we 
uh, it, it came from this to get to the beautiful hybrids you're gonna see later on in the program. And there is a variegated form of Iris Insata, um, Iris Insata variegata. Um, and there is a registered form of that called silver band. Um, and it has um, sil uh, silvery green and cream um, variegation um, that again is 100% stable variegation similar to the rest of the irises that are variegated, but not similar to other plants. And those of you who are gardeners who have bought variegated plants and brought them home and only to have them revert back to not variegated, um, irises will not frustrate frustrate you that way. This is a, a, a Japanese iris called Rose Queen, and we believe that this is a collected species that was just a pink mutation that um, came along um, naturally in the wild, um, brought to the States and registered in the, I, I, again, I think around the 1980s. And um, still is one of the favorite irises in my garden every year. And this is my first, um, I guess it's not the first one I've shown you, but species iris um, can also, species Japanese iris can also have six fall form, where we, if you notice on this flower, there are no standards, um, but six falls. And you can tell it six falls instead of three droopy standards because there's a signal on each and every of the six flower uh, petals. Um, this particular clone, I'm growing it in my garden, and and it it's unique in that the first um, three, four, five blossoms up or bloom stalks up, put out six fall flowers, and then beyond that, it, there are three three falls. So. Um, it's it's a genetic trait, but it's, apparently it's not a very strong genetic trait in, in this clone right here. <sighs> okay. Um, there are three recognized forms of Japanese iris. Uh, a three fall or, or called a single. And in a three fall is like a typical iris. You have three petals pointing downwards and three petals pointing upwards falls and standards. Um, hybridizers um, have taken the, the, the six fall genetics and, and which we call a double um, and have, have bred that to, um, um, to, to get big fat flowers uh, like you see on the right with Nihokai. Um, and, and when you're breeding, um, the six fall tends to be actually a dominant trait and if you breed a six fall with a three fall, you're going to get more six fall iris uh, uh, seedlings than you are three fall. Okay. So the standards have been converted to falls and all six petals have a signal. If you don't have um, signals on your petals, then what you have is floppy falls, which is a, uh, I'm sorry, floppy standards, which uh, is considered a fault. And these were first recorded in the early 1700s. And then we also have um, nine or more fall Japanese iris, which we call multi-petal. And with those, the style arms and stamens and other parts of the flowers may have been converted to falls as well. And um, several years ago, I was looking at a particularly massive multi-petal Japanese iris and picked it and started counting the petals. And then I opened up the ovaries and all the eggs inside the ovaries were, uh, had been converted into petal material as well. And so that one really just wanted to be a lot of, a lot of petals. And these were first recorded um, sometime in the late 1700s. And some examples of some three fall, modern three fall hybrids. Um, this is um, one of our most favorites in our garden. This is Crayola solstice from Lee Harris. He has, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Lee Walker. He has a series of Crayola irises that um, have a particular waxy um, um, substance uh, to them. And um, 
and there's there's a series of them, and and mo and all of them are very nice irises. I have one more coming up a little later that's uh, just drop dead gorgeous. Um, this is another three fall um, from Chad Harris called Freckled Peacock. And a nice frilly one from uh, Jill Copeland called John's Fancy. Pink is a thing um, in, in Japanese iris. This one's Oso oh Pink from Don Delmez. Um, this is a pain metal winner. And this is an old one from um, a gentleman by the name of Walter Marks um, called Skyrocket Burst. Um, one of the larger flowers you'll find in a Japanese iris, if you were to hold those petals out, um, they would measure between 10 and 12 inches. Um, so dinner plate size flowers. And, and this is a, a small blue flower called Sweetie Pie from Don Delmez. And I promised you earlier that I would show you what crepe paper texture looks like, and Geshunka does that. This is um, um, a beautiful six fall iris. Um, and from Darlene Wilkinson at Greywoods Farms, this is um, Greywood Zampata. And um, this is probably the largest flower we have in our garden. It will stretch out as much as 14 inches when it gets plenty of water and plenty of fertilizer. Um, just a big, massive flower. Chad Harris's Koto Harp Strings. Uh, Terry Aiken's Rivulets of Wine. And I will tell you that I have many seedlings in my garden out of Rivulets of Wine, and I hope um, they bloom this year. And this is my favorite of the Crayola series. This is Lee Walker's Crayola Kiss, and when it's in bloom in the garden, um, it's just a stunner. And most, most of the irises, um, the Japanese iris in our garden are Higo style, um, which is the, the gently arching form. Um, Crayola Kiss is the Edo style, which is the flat form. And um, so it's a, it's a really great iris. But my favorite iris of all is um, from Lorena Reed, and that is Freckled Geisha, and that's this one here. And when she's in bloom, um, it's, uh, it's just a sight to behold. Then we have our multi-petal. Um, this is Frosted Pyramid from a Walter Marks um, circa 1955, maybe, maybe 54. Um, and uh, so 70 years old um, and still used today for, by hybridizers because it throws off um, really great form children. Um, so Frosted Pyramid. One of Chad's again, Blushing Snow Maiden. Uh, Lion King from Bauer Koval. This one won the pain medal. Luxor Temple, um, and you're gonna see this again little, a little bit later on um, when I talk about repeat bloom. Um, this one has the longest bloom season of any Japanese iris in our garden. Um, it'll start in July and finish in um, late November for us. And Tropical Storm. And those of you who know um, Bauer Koble at, at, at Ensada Gardens um, know that they are, were very into um, the multi-petal in both their Japanese and their Siberian breeding. And most of our multi-petal irises, uh, Japanese irises come from Bauer Koble. Um, but this is the, the, the best of the bunch. Um, Chad Harris um, worked with a, a friend of his to bring um, several hundred um, historic irises from Japan um, into his garden um, over the last, um, I don't know, five or six years, maybe, maybe eight years. And um, this is a modern hybrid of theirs that came with his historics. And as far as um, nine uh, or more fall Japanese iris, this one's just a dream. It, it is gorgeous in every way. And uh, I hope Chad gets it registered soon so we can start selling it. Okay. Um, repeat bloom, I promised you we'd talk about that. Um, in bearded irises, it's called rebloom. In beardless, we call it repeat bloom. 
And, and so uh, what, what Japanese iris will tend to do is bloom during their regular season and take a week or two off and then start blooming again. And some of them will put up one flesh of bloom stalks and then be done. Or some of them will um, um, just continue blooming until the first hard frost um, freezes them off. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of Terry Aikens called Midnight Fireworks. And um, anyways, um, varieties of Japanese iris that repeat bloom are genetically predisposed to do that. Not just any Japanese iris will do it. They have to be um, genetically um, willing. Um, and good culture and care, of course, will increase your plant's ability to repeat. Um, the more water, the more fertilizer, the more compost you give them, the, the more they're going to rebloom or repeat bloom. And um, Terry Aiken likes to brag that he has pictures of midnight fireworks um, blooming on December 1st. So in his garden, Japanese irises start to bloom the end of May. Um, and so from let's, let's call it early June until December 1st, that's a very long bloom season. Um, and I know Chad Harris has, um, has had one and now has another um, Japanese iris that he claims blooms for 180 days. Um, and I have a piece of it in my garden and I can't get it to increase enough because it blooms as much as it can every year while still leaving me two or three fans. And some examples of good repeat bloomers is Terry Aiken's uh, Red Repeater. And I do wanna mention this, this is Carol Johnson. It is a tetraploid Japanese iris. And we will get into that here in just a moment. But uh, at least in our garden, the tetraploid Japanese irises have a much higher percentage of repeat bloom than the diploids do. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit as well. Um, yellow, I promised you we'd talk a little bit about yellow. And um, I believe that um, in the US, hy hybridizing for yellow all came from, um, or at least some of it started with Love Goddess, um, which is uh, um, Mr. Payne's hybrid from 1969. And if you see the butter, uh, buttery style arms and the yellow signal with the veins that are starting to extend down the falls, um, that's where the hybridizers are working to develop a, the yellow Japanese irises, take those um, signals and bring that color all the way down to the bottom of the falls. And so starting with Love Goddess um, and many generations later, um, Chad Harris put out Bewitching Twilight, which um, is pushing the yellow even further down the falls and, and diffusing the signal quite a bit outwards. And Jill Copeland came out with Little Bit Yellow um, in 2014. And Little Bit Yellow is probably the yellowest Japanese iris I grow. I know it's the yellowest. Um, it has um, some disturbing faults to it that um, make it difficult for um, me to grow. Um, but it's the yellowest. And I took this and crossed it with one of my irises and got something less yellow with something that I would say has better form than a little bit yellow, but um, certainly not something I would um, allow anybody outside my family to see in bloom. It's, it's not a pretty iris, but um, so we're working, we're getting there. Tetraploids. So, so all Japanese iris come from a single species and that species is Iris insata. And Iris insata is a diploid. Um, and a diploid means it has two sets of chromosomes. It has two sets of 12 chromosomes for a total of 24. Now, what I'm about to explain to you to me is magic. I have never done it. I only have the vaguest awareness of how it's done. And that's as much as I really want to know. I know it's possible and I'll let other people do all the work. Thank you, Lee Walker. 
Um, the first person to do it was um, Courier McEwen. And so you, you take a chemical similar, either colchicine or some similar chemicals and, and you introduce it to the um, seed at the time the seed begins to germinate. And what, it, what that will do is as the, the first cell's chromosome double, the chemicals cause the cell to not divide. And so um, you get the, the um, double the number of chromosomes within that single cell. So you go from two sets of 12 to two sets, uh, to four sets of, uh, four sets of 12. And, and from 24 total chromosomes, now you have 48. And, and so that's the process. Now, um, there's arguments um, for and against. Um, the, the one argument for is that um, you get a heavier substance with your flower, twice the chromosomes gives you a heavier substance. And so they're better able to withstand weather extremes. Um, and I've seen that in person. Um, and I will say that heavy substance is good. In some ways, it's also uh, uh, a negative in other ways. Um, the, one, the one thing that um, is definitely a positive is that the more chromosomes, the larger potential for genetic variation. So um, the better the chance you are to get um, brighter, stronger, different colors and patterns. Some of the negatives to them is they do lose their graceful presence. So there is nothing greater than seeing um, skyrocket burst, which, which I showed you earlier, um, which is um, three and a half, four feet tall with a 12 inch diameter flower, um, light, light in substance, um, just on a breezy day that it's just fluttering in the breeze, a clump of it, it is just a thing to, um, it's very impressive. Um, and when you go to tetraploid, you lose that flutter in the breeze. You get a, a stiff, starchy flower that um, does everything but flutter. Um, and and the, the tetraploids that are on the market now, their foliage tends to be a little bit unruly. And um, those of us who are iris judges um, will agree that unruly foliage is, is a fault. Um, and then um, some of the tetraploids will tend to rebloom themselves to death. Um, and, and, and that's definitely a fault as well. Um, not the first tetraploid Japanese, but the first, um, I don't know, famous is the wrong word, but we'll go with it. Famous um, tetraploid is Japanese pinwheel by Courier McEwen. Um, it won the pain medal. Um, many years ago in in the uh, 1980s i think maybe early 90s and um in my garden and i i cannot explain why but it never fully opens um the the stand the the fall states stay no i need to stir that fire up anyway the fall stay cut and um and so i Early on in my um, iris growing life, um, I grew it and I wondered what on God's green earth the judges were thinking, um, giving it the pain metal to this iris that never fully opens. And then I went back east and saw it blooming in hot and humid conditions and it was huge and full and laid out nicely and just glorious. And I went, oh, that's why. So Japanese pinwheel. And a couple other of the tetraploids that are out there on the market. This is Thoroughbred and Main Elegance. And before I go to that, and, and I wanna say that um, in the Japanese iris world, there has not been a lot of work done with tetraploids, hybridizing. Um, Kuro McEwen um, started it. Um, Lee Walker is the only one I know today that still chemically converts um, irises from diploid to tetraploid. Um, and you'll see some of his tetraploids here in a bit. Um, Chad Harris, I know, 
has hybridized from tet, uh, tetraploid stock, and but has not introduced any to yet, I don't think. Um, but not a lot of work has been done with them. Um, and when I when I if you come into my garden, you're going to hear me badmouth tetraploid Japanese irises. And I, and I don't want that to cross over into the Siberian world, Siberian iris world, where um, hybridizers have done a lot of work with tetraploid. And um, uh, Bob Hollingworth does, um, um, Dean Cole and, and uh, a couple other people have done a lot of work with them and very, very good work. And we have just some just amazing tetraploid Siberian irises in our in, in our garden. Um, so um, right now I poo poo the tetraploid Japanese irises, but only because um, there just hasn't been enough work done with them yet. We, we're still generations away from them being truly great irises. Um, and I like to point out an oddity here. Um, this is a, a an iris that came to us from Japan. This is Yae Katsumi. Um, and this has what's called hose and hose form, where it is a, a six fall iris. Um, and then out of those six falls, it has another six falls that open on top for a total of 12 falls. And, um, and so that's kind of an oddity in, in the um, iris world. And Chad Harris took this and made a cross with it. I'm sorry, I can't tell you the parentage, but from that, he got his pagoda temple which is um, a, a, a very nice iris. Again, a six fall um, with another six falls that open out on top. And so it'll have 12 petals, um, all with signals on them. Um, back in, I don't remember when, um, 2015 maybe, 2017, um, I made a cross um, using Sujo um, as the pollen parent and Yai Katsumi, I'm sorry, I use Sujo as the, um, the mother and pollen from Yai Katsumi um, and made the cross. And um, I got some very interesting results from this. Um, Sujo is just a gorgeous iris to start with. But um, I got about 70 seedlings and lined them all out. And half of them were very, very average three fall irises. Um, which immediately got dug up and composted. Um, of the half that remained, um, um, so a quarter of them ended up being hose and, uh, I'm sorry, half of them be, were hose and hose form. And of those, um, half were a three fall iris with another three fall coming out of the middle, similar to this. And so, oh, I guess I did it in 2014. Um, so you can see three falls and three standards. And then you see um, the next flower starting to come out of the center of it. And that will be another three, fa three falls and three standards on top. And so um, half were that and half were um, six fall. And um, this is um, the seedling that I found to be the most enjoyable. Um, it has great full form. And when you look at it from, um, where you can see all 12 petals, it's like the bottom, the bottom six falls are one flower and the top six falls are a different flower, um, white with blue veins and white with purple veins. So anyways, it's a fun thing um, to play with. And um, if you go to the um, national convention, AIS national convention in Portland in 2024, you will see both of these seedlings in bloom, I hope. And this is a picture of my very first um, seedling patch. And I wanted to share with you a few of my successes as we went along the way. And I made my first cross in um, 2009, I think, 2007. And this was the fourth cross I made that year between Anatus and Frosted Intrigue and came up with a couple of pretty good, two pretty good irises out of it. And this is our 2022 introduction called Wiley Creek. And several years later, uh, I made a cross using Chad's Bewitching Twilight, a pain metal winning iris. 
and Lorena Reed sing the blues, another pain metal winning iris. And that's when I learned that if you use metal winning irises, you're probably gonna get great children because out of this cross, I got 13 seedlings that I kept, I, I selected for further viewing and every one of them is, is, is drop dead gorgeous. And this year's introduction is Nutcracker Sweet, which is a pure white um, with amazing form and great ruffling. And we called it Nutcracker Sweet because uh, it reminds me of the ballerinas um, in um, the dance, uh, dance of the Snowflakes. Um, and uh, so it looks like a pirouette where the ballerinas in full, uh, I'm sorry, a tutu where the ballerinas in full pirouette, so. Um, but um, a sibling to it is uh, is this one where we got the nice blue uh, with good form and ruffling. Um, but the real prize was this one and the, probably the best form Japanese iris I grow and um, just delightfully colored and nicely ruffled as well. So things you might see um, in the future on the market. And I wanted to share with you some seedlings um, from other hybridizers out there. So um, these two um, came from Darlene Wilkinson from um, Greywood Farms in Massachusetts. Um, and um, she took her own um, hybrid Greywood Safrina and crossed it with the seedling number 11-20, which was butterflies in flight crossed with capricium butterfly. And this is what she got from it. And her notes say that um, it is a white hazy ground sanded and lightly freckled blue violet. And um, it frequently has um, 12 or more falls, and, which I find interesting since um, Greywood Safrina is a six fall, Butterflies in Flight is a six fall and Capricium Butterfly is a six fall. I'm not sure where the multi-petal genetics came from, um, but um, uh, this is um, GWF 15-28, and I think you can expect this to come out from Greywood Farms um, in the next year or two. And then she also took uh, Greywood Flowing Water and crossed it with another one of her seedlings called 10-18. Um, um, and this was the hybrid that came from that. And her notes for this say it's a white, white, wavy, icy lavender blue fading out to white blue edges, thin blue lines, good foliage and fertile. Um, and she says, I love the blues here, going back to Courier McEwen's blue seedlings and that people should use it for blue breeding. So that's Darlene Wilkinson from Greywood Farms in Massachusetts. And then um, the good looking gentleman in the picture there is Chad Harris. Um, and he sent me two, two seedlings to share with you, two pictures of two seedlings to share with you. Um, and he took um, his recent introduction called Simple Grace and crossed it with um, one of his seedlings, 07JB2. And so he took a dark red violet and a lighter red violet and somehow managed to get a lavender pink out of that. And he wanted me to be very clear with you, this is not a pink flower. He, he, he wanted me to be very clear that if I can find his note, it is a pastel lilac. And it has a long, long bloom time with five to seven bloods, buds plus rebloom. And Chad, nod your head if this is your 180 day um, Japanese iris. Um, many generations involving taffeta and velvet, good omen, midnight fireworks, Darigo pink milestone and simple grace plus several select seedlings. So it has a very long, um, um, long history of breeding to get to this one iris. Um, Then the next one he wanted me to show um, was a cross between Night Angel, one of Terry Aiken's um, hybrids. And I'm gonna tell the story on Terry um, in that I know that um, Bauer Koble at Ensada Gardens 
and Chad Harris have used Night Angel extensively in their breeding. And for whatever reason, Terry Aiken has not. Um, and it's been a very successful parent. And I have children out of it in my garden too. Anyways, he crossed that with Frosted Intrigue and came up with an iris that I did not think was possible until I saw it blooming in his garden one day. Um, in his notes, um, let's see, 40 inches tall, mid-sized blooms, up to eight inches, from the most prolific reselect seedlings and introduction lines for us to date. Um, and this has um, siblings on the market um, that, um, called Columbia Crest, Columbia Deepwater, Dow Whitewater, Coto Harp Strings, Mulberry Halos, Sanded Treasure. Um, that was a very successful um, crop, so successful of a cross for Chad that he's made it many times over. Now I said, I didn't think this was a, a possible because I didn't think the genetics existed for a pure white flower with colored style arms. Um, and had long discussions about that possibility with, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Bauer Coble at Ensada Gardens. And um, I would have said this is impossible until I saw it blooming in his garden. And if I hadn't seen it in person, I would have thought that Chad photoshopped the picture. But um, I am happy to say Chad doesn't know how to use Photoshop. So um, that's what it really looks like, the impossibility come true. Well done, chat. Okay, um, I don't have the parentage on Lee Walker's, um, but I do have a couple of good pictures of two of his seedlings and I wanna point them out because both of them are tetraploids. Um, and, um, and, and more than just the fact that they're tetraploid, but um, in my opinion, they're very nice tetraploids. And, and that's strong praise from me. Um, and so I'm sorry, on my screen, I can't see the seedling number. So I'm gonna trust you guys to be able to read it. Um, and then, oh, so a beautiful lavender, I'm sorry, white with purple, purple veins and purple standards and style arms. Um, this one um, will rebloom um, every year, but not to the point of extinction. This one reblooms very nicely repeat blooms very nicely and um, but still has plenty of increase every year. So very nice seedling. And then this one's the really the one we really enjoy. It's a nice screaming hot pink, um, lavender pink color um, with that blue halo around the, the gold signal. It, just a stunning, stunning seedling. So two from Lee Walker. Um, using iris and sada to create species cross irises. So iris and sada can be crossed with certain other species of iris. Um, some of them very successfully, some of them very difficultly, and some can't be done at all. But um, the most popular of those um, involves the cross with iris pseudocorus. And I want to give a warning that um, iris pseudocorus, pure iris pseudocorus, in the state of Washington and many other states is a class C noxious weed. And um, when I do my iris talks to local garden clubs and whatnot, we, we talk specifically about this and, and say that they should not grow it. And if they do, they should dig it up and let me give them an equally good yellow iris that will take its place just fine. Um, so, but if you use iris pseudocorus and cross it with iris and sada, um, as seen here, you get these really fabulous irises that we call um, a sudata or, or perhaps an eyelash iris. Um, and great thing about them is um, they're, they're, they're tall. They have a mul multiple branches with many buds and um, for a long bloom season and they have glorious spring foliage. Um, emerge um, this bright gold or, or chartreuse color. And in the early spring, um, it just glows in the sunlight. Um, as the season progresses, that foliage turns green. And by the time the flowers are in bloom, you just have a, um, a big green clump of foliage with beautiful flowers dangling over them. And I wanted to share, oh, 
I'm sorry. Best of all, sudatas are completely sterile, um, which is um, takes away the classy noxious weed part of the equation. Um, I did want to point out this is a, a seedling picture that Jill Copeland sent me, one of her um, sudata seedlings, and wow, two is her seedling number. Um, um, I found it to be very striking. And a couple other on the market. This is um, Chad's French buttercream. And um, this is uh, Hiroshi Shimizu's um, Yasha uh, that came to us through Carol Warner. And another one of his and my wife Margaret's personal favorite is Kurokawa no. Um, and again, four or more feet tall with um, lots of branching, lots of buds, beautiful, easy to grow irises. Um, at least in our climate. Okay, so I'm going to be honest, the Japanese iris, as far as irises go, are a high maintenance garden plant. They, they are, uh, 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 they, they require a little bit of extra care. Um, number one, they require an acidic soil. Um, this says 7.0, I would say probably 6.5 is, is better. Um, and six might even be better than that. I know that you can get too low on the pH and, and they start to suffer from that, but um, between six and seven is where you want to be. Um, they require a minimum of one inch of water per week and more is better. Um, Chad Harris will tell you that they require six inches of water per week, um, but uh, I pay for my water so they don't get six inches of water a week. Um, so they're, they're, water, they're very water hungry. They're also heavy feeders. Um, we give ours um, compost, air, fresh compost every year, and we fertilize ours with uh, a high nitrogen fertilizer. We use um, ammonium sulfate, which is uh, known as, which is uh, 2100. So pure nitrogen fertilizer, and then they get the rest of their minerals and whatnot from the compost that I give them. Um, and then they need to be moved to new soil every three to five years. Um, they, they, they emit, their rhizomes emit a chemical that is toxic to Japanese irises. And um, will and and so they will commit what the Japanese call seppuku where they will decide to kill themselves now it's it's kind of a funny thing um how these grow in the wild is um they're on um river banks or stream banks and or wet marshy fields and that have a constant supply of moisture um pushing those chemicals away from the rhizomes and um, so so in nature the uh, nature uses water to wash that chemical away um, in my garden in particular um, nature doesn't do that and so we need to lift our our irises out of the ground and move them to new soil every every three to five years um, if you don't have unlimited space like we do. Um, we have five acres, so it's pretty easy of, easy for us to move it to new soil every every th three years. Um, you can, um, as you dig it, you can pull the soil out from around it and replenish it with fresh compost um, and soil that hasn't had Japanese iris growing in it. Um, so it, it, it's easily overcome, but it's it's another another thing that um, that needs to be dealt with. Okay. Um, I, I, I will say before I move on, um, they're, they're high maintenance, but um, for these massive four foot tall, 10 to 12 inch diameter flowers um, that are absolute showstoppers when they're open in your garden, um, that it's worth the effort. Okay, so they can be transplanted in the spring or the fall or any time in between, if you can keep them well watered until your fall rains come. Um, for us, we get drought from, from 
early July until mid to late September. And, and we have been successful um, transplanting any time during then, um, but we need to water them uh, a couple of times a week until the rains come. So uh, spring or fall or any time in between if you can water. Um, and it's most important that you keep the rhizomes and roots um, soaking in water um, at all times when they're out of the ground, unless they're in your hand while you are trimming them. So um, they, they must stay wet. You cannot let them sit out for any amount of time. Okay, um, this is how we divide them here. And um, again, you can do it spring or fall. This is spring. So um, probably late April or early May is the clump you see in front of you. Um, and so dig your clump. Um, I like to use the back of my shovel to knock the dirt out of the roots as best I can. You can also, I'm sorry, you can also use a hose and, and spray it until the root, until the, the bulk of the dirt comes out, um, whatever your preference is. Um, and then you need to break them into manageable divisions. Um, and sometimes it happens very easily. You can just pry them apart by hand and sometimes you need to take a shovel um, and just cut them in half and then into quarters and then into smaller pieces. Um, and from there, you just start to trim away the old roots and um, just um, come up underneath the rhizome and just start trimming. And if you need to, uh, if you can't separate them by hand, you can take your clippers like you see on the right picture and just start cutting them into pieces. Um, and, and so there's what a Japanese iris rhizome looks like, um, cut in half. And when you get down to the end, this is what you're left with. Um, a great gob of um, anywhere from one fan to five fans, and all of those are viable. Um, plant your single fans the same as you do your, your, your uh, multiple fans, and, and they'll do just fine. Patrick, and, I have a question in chat from Karen it says, can the soil that the iris is being moved from be amended and reused after a few years? Um, yes, I do that. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, this spring, I'm gonna be transplanting back into a field that had Japanese iris in it up to six years ago. And um, we are, uh, I will be amending the soil heavily to combat that problem. So great. Okay. If you were to do the same thing in the fall, you would start with a clump that looks like this. And then, and you would end with divisions that look like that. But it's the same process all the way through. Break them into smaller and smaller pieces, trimming the roots and the rhizomes as you go. Okay. But always, always, if they're not in your hand, they're soaking in water. Um, for planting, um, every year we amend, uh, every time we transplant, we first amend the soil with compost. And um, for you, um, dig your hole, which is gonna be, I don't know, um, for a division, you're gonna go a, a foot or a foot and a half wide and six or eight inches deep. And what I would do is, is dig the soil out of your hole, fill it, halfway with compost, put half the soil back in, mix it up real good, and then open your hole up again. Um, I, I plant lots of them at once, so I dig a trench, I fill them halfway up with compost, and then I rototill them in. To um, planting, I like I said, you dig your hole, however wide you're going to dig it, um, this here is, is particularly loose soil, so I just um, barely clear enough to get the rhizome in the ground. Um, and, and so I dig it about six inches deep. And then I build a shelf that um, sits about two or maybe three inches deep. Um, and I set the rhizome directly on the shelf and I push the roots down into the deeper hole backfill and tamp down tightly. And then I compost, uh, I mulch it, 
Um, I use compost. You can use whatever kind of mulch you like, but you're going to find that having mulch around the crown of your Japanese iris will help it retain moisture and help keep the soil cool. Um, and, um, and so mulching is a good thing. We use compost. And then immediately you want to wire it in well. Um, soak it completely. Um, don't put it in the ground and then wait a day or three before you water them. Um, they, they will not be happy with you if you do that. So um, water well. I have a couple questions for you. Yes, sir. Uh, one is, does the foliage die back completely at the end of the season? Um, in our garden, the foliage dies back to the ground 99.9% um, .9 of the way. Um, all winter long, if I went out there, I would see a little tiny bit of green um, in, in most of the clumps. So, so I'm going to say, yes, it dies back all the way um, shortly after first frost. And then in our, in our garden, um, sometime in early April is when you'll see it start to sprout back. OK. Yeah, so in my we, garden here in the Midwest, it, they, they die back completely. Yeah, but you get really cold. Yes, the ground's frozen right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, have a, a question from Bob Hollingworth. Do sudatas also commit seppuku? Uh, um, okay, that's a great question. I, and, and I don't know the answer to that. That's a better question for Carol Warner, who's grown them the longest, I think, and perhaps Chad Harris. But I will say that I have two clumps of sudata in my garden that have been in place for seven years and they're stronger today than they were five years ago. So um, I'm going to say no, but I'm also going to say that I'm not the person to ask that question. I, I, do, have the answer. I do have the answer to that. Go ahead, Chad. Yeah, uh, really quick. It, it, it's a genetic thing, so it depends on what part of the genes did the did that plant get? Did it get most of the insada or did it get pseudochorus? I, I've done entire fields of seedlings where um, only maybe about 10% actually act very good and as a garden plant and the other 80 to 90 percent die on year three and four like an insada. There you go. You got it from the expert's mouth. Thank you, Chad. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, another question. What kind of compost do you recommend? Um, a, great idea, a great question. Um, what I recommend is not what I do. Um, what I recommend, Chad Harris um, goes to Lowe's and he buys the um, bags of aged manure and um, and that's what he uses to amend his soil. Um, and I highly recommend that because it's very low in, in, in weed seed content um, and very high in nutrients. Um, and it's reasonably inexpensive and also easy to manage one bag at a time. Um, we have a local um, company that um, makes their own compost and I drive up with my trailer and they take their tractor and dump two yards in and I drive away and it takes me two minutes and I back up to the field and I shovel it out. So um, I'm going to say uh, the best is, is the Lowe's method, although that's not what I do. Okay. Um, I, I, pre I presume Home Depot or whatever your local garden center has an equivalent product. Okay. And skipping down a minute, someone, uh, Jeff Bennett asked, cow or chicken manure? Uh, cow. Mm -hmm. um, chicken manure is really, really hot, really, really high in nitrogen, probably too high in nitrogen. Um, we have um, a different local producer that um, uses chicken manure, and I tried that one time and killed a whole row of Japanese iris on me. I would not do that ever again for any reason. And uh, Del Perry asked, how about rabbit manure? Um, rabbit manure is pretty hot too. If you're gonna do it, 
Um, do it sparingly and don't do it to something that you really care about. I've not tried it. Um, I would be very leery of it. Okay. Um, then uh, Dale has another question. How deep should the top of the rhizome be planted? Um, two to three inches below the soil level. Um, Japanese iris grow different than bearded iris do. Um, bearded iris, as they increase, they move outward. And so your clump is, is always expanding outward. Japanese iris will expand to a certain diameter, generally about a foot and a half diameter, and then they'll um, grow upward and out of the soil. Um, and so plant your rhizome two to three inches deep, and by the time they've grown up out of the soil, they're telling you they need to be moved to somewhere different and replanted, broken up and replanted. Okay. Yep. Um, and a question from Eileen Hollander, and this one may be something you're going to talk about a little later. So if you want to go to that, but she asks, uh, says, please give info how to grow them in pots. I grow a few in pots in tubs in New Orleans and in more shade than I would grow the Louisiana irises. Okay. I do not cover that in this program. And okay. I am going to cop out on this one and ask Chad Harris to step back in and explain growing them in pot culture because he is our local master at that. Chad, are you willing? Um, sort of. <laughs> um, pot culture uh, or container culture. Uh, you know, if you, the... if you want to go to this next week, uh, we're going to have a, a, a webinar on, on uh, container grown irises. You could include that. I'm sure Doug Chiz would be happy to um, have that information included if, if you're not ready for that right now. Oh, yeah, I can do that really quick. The okay. container, the containers, I, I, they, they grow them in containers in Japan. They grow many of them. And it's for the reason is that they can not only the aesthetic like be covered uh, that they're brought indoors, but however, they are also for the, the problems with the soil and with the rejuvenation of the soil. So in containers, they are grown and out of the container, they are lifted and divided every year or every other year in containers. And what you want to use is a really good peat-based soil, soilless uh, potting mix uh, for any uh, container. And, um, and just go up to like about a three, a three gallon container, three to four gallon container and lift and divide every other year. And, and keep them evenly moist uh, during the summertime and then dry them out in the wintertime. If you have deep freezes, they need to be buried or brought into an area that is uh, like they do in uh, Europe. They bring them into a sheltered, uh, oh, like a uh, hoop house where it doesn't go into the deep freeze because you don't want that container to be deep freezed either. Okay. Um, and uh, related to that, uh, Michael says, any tips for growing in large containers suspended above a pond? I want to establish, establish them along a zigzag bridge. And how wet is too wet? And okay. That, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. You go ahead, Chad. Okay. That's an easy one. As long as the crown of the plant is about four to six inches above the water line. There's a really good, uh, there's, a, there's a, a botanical garden, St. Louis, that uh, they grow them along the Zinzeg Bridge. Uh, one of our iris uh, bulletins, uh, the irises, uh, has a very good uh, cover photograph from about 15, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, with Japanese irises. And you take a look at that, you'll see that those are boxes that are built in the water. They are backfilled, and that, but you can actually see that the plants are actually anywhere from four to six inches above the water line. Okay, great. And, and to, to further answer that, um, as far as Japanese iris go, as long as the crown is above water level, there is no too wet. You, can, you cannot be too wet as long as that crown is above water level. Okay. Um, and then uh, one uh, one more comment from Lisa uh, about uh, manure says, 
horse manure is mild. I can top dress with ease. Yes, agreed. Horse manure was the first manure I ever used, and it was great. The Japanese iris loved it. Um, the people who make my compost now um, run a dairy farm, and so um, for them, um, cow manure is um, easy to come by. Okay, great. That's all I have right now. Okay, um, good. Uh, water well. Okay, pests and disease. Um, pests in our garden, um, rabbits will sneak on the property and will eat the young foliage. Um, a good healthy Japanese iris will grow out of that, but if you have a young plant or a newly planted one, um, that, that could be a potential problem. And I'm going to leave you to um, devise your own plan for dealing with rabbits. We have a, a breeding pair of red-tailed hawks that keep our, our rabbit population to, to a minimum. Um, if you live in an area um, that has slugs, uh, we certainly do. Um, we recommend a commercial product called Sluggo. There are many different um, methods and theories. Um, Sluggo is good and is relatively safe, relatively pet safe. Um, and it, um, uh, but of course, as with all the other products that are out there, um, rain will wash it away. So um, you're constantly reusing it. Um, aphids can tend to be a problem. Um, and if you go grow other irises, um, that's no surprise. Um, there are many insecticides that'll deal with aphids. We like the thumb and forefinger method because there's nothing more satisfying than the sound of a popping aphid. Um, but we have a special case here on, at Cascadia Iris Gardens in that we have um, a, a thriving population of that thatching ants um, that um, go through our garden and harvest um, all of our aphids and keep them off of our irises. So we'll find the occasional outbreak, but it's never um, more than um, 30 seconds worth of um, pest management for us. So um, um, for mica obscuris, if you're into um, their scientific name, um, also known as thatching ants. Um, Trips are a problem with Japanese iris. There are um, thrips that will live down in the, the base of the foliage of the Japanese iris plant. And as the um, foliage grows, it will chew on the foliage and, um, um, and so um, the, the thrips can, can, can weaken the plant. And, and but the worst thing they do is um, they will turn your foliage rust colored um, in the late summer and fall. And, and it's not pretty by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and um, we treat ours with uh, uh, imidacloprid, um, a product called Merit, um, and um, which uh, is not the um, most particular bug friendly thing out there. So, we stress out about it every year because of uh, bumblebees and whatnot. But um, if you grow Japanese iris, you need to be prepared to deal with thrips. Um, I hear that iris borer is a problem. Um, we don't have them in our garden. And um, I didn't, I, I had never seen the, um, what, what iris borer does to irises until I was in, Maryland for the Siberian Convention um, years ago. Um, and um, I, I, I learned that if I lived in an area that had to deal with iris borer, I would be a peony grower today. Um, and um, I am very thankful that I do not have to deal with that nonsense. And as discussed, they're harmful to themselves. Um, they need um, to repeat, they need to be uh, dug and moved to new soil every three to five years. Um, but they're relatively disease free. We find a few clones that um, might show a little bit of virus on them. And um, um, it, when I find those, um, they immediately disappear out of my garden. I just, I just won't even deal with that nonsense. 
So, but uh, relatively disease free. There's a, a couple of comments. Uh, Scott Hall says sluggo is iron phosphate, degrades into fertilizer. And um, Melanie Deason says Maximilian sunflowers are great host plants for aphids. Then I dust the maxis with diatomaceous earth with pyrethrins and the aphids are history. After a year or so, the aphids may not reappear. Hope that helps. There you go. Um, there are uh, as many stars as there are in the sky, there are ways of dealing with um, aphids. Um, we like the ant problem because Somebody else does my work for me. Onward. Um, now that um, I've sold you that Japanese iris are the greatest of all the different types of virus and that you all want to go out now and um, cover your entire property with um, Chad Harris's new introductions. Um, there are commercial sources out there. Um, Aiken Salmon Creek Garden, Our Place, Draycott Gardens, and Sada Gardens, um, Greywood Farm, Mount Pleasant, and Wildwood Gardens are the um, ones that um, advertise in, uh, in the SJI publication. Um, and um, I recommend each and every one of them. Um, all are reputable growers and, and put out pretty good product. So. Um, if you have questions about um, where to get them, go to um, socji.org, which is um, the Society for Japanese Iris website that Chad Harris manages and go to the commercial page and you'll get all the information you need for all of these different growers. <laughs>